from the College by the Lake, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Local, regional, national, and international guests discussing the issues and topics affecting the way you live are on Forum, the North Idaho College Public Forum, with your host and moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. I welcome you to our part two of the special series entitled Facing the Threat. Once again, I want to thank the Northwest Coalition Against Malicious Harassment for sharing their guest speakers with us as they did this conference at Gonzaga University in October. We're very fortunate to have two guests today to discuss two areas of this issue of facing the threat. First of all, we're going to talk about mainstreaming of the white supremacy movement, and secondly, what is the common law uh, courts movement. Uh, I welcome to the program, first of all, an old friend that I've known for many years, Leonard Zeskin, who is the president of the Institute for Research and Education on Human Rights. Our guest has also uh, been a staff person of the Center for Democratic Renewal out of Atlanta uh, in the past, and that's a well-known nationwide human rights group. Uh, Lanny, it's a pleasure to welcome you back. And, uh, Thank you, Tony. It's good to be here. And it's to really see you good. after some years of absence from our part of the country. Uh, and secondly, I'd like to welcome to the program Marlene Hines, who is the director of the Mountain States uh, Network Against Bigotry, and she's going to discuss with us uh, the issue of the common law courts while Lanny talks about uh, mainstreaming white supremacy. And Marlene, it's a pleasure to have you on the program. Thanks, Tony. Uh, Lanny, may I start with you? And uh, what we're trying to do in this series is to inform our viewers about uh, extremist movements. And in this case today, uh, within the United States, we last week talked some about what went on in Canada and Germany. Uh, would you bring us up to date on what is developing among various, what we call white supremacist groups, some identification of where they are and how they are alike or different, and then we'll get into how they're changing their tactic uh, under the presentation that you have concerning mainstreaming. Well, I think that what we've seen is uh, the white supremacist movement starting to take two roads. And the white supremacist movement are those people who believe that society is, is or should be ordered um, by uh, biological determinism. That is, uh, people's racial differences um, become the basis of superiority and inferiority. And that's a big movement that encompasses all sorts of different kinds of factions, from the common law court types um, over to the David Duke types and everything in between and on both sides of. And uh, while there has always been a terrorist wing of this movement that's interested in robbing banks and bombing buildings and trying to terrorize their opponents, we've also seen the development of people who um, have the same ideas but are trying to uh, run for political office or get big church followings or infiltrate other larger conservative organizations and work them in a certain direction. And really what I'll be talking about at the Northwest Coalition Conference is that second group, uh, which in some ways is more dangerous than the group that just wants to blow up buildings and ultimately is usually after much mayhem caught by the police. Let's go into that in some more detail. I know that in, in some of the research and work you've done before, you identified this in this uh, disagreement and not philosophy, but tactics has been going on for some time. Of these two approaches, which one is most prevalent in the United States today? Well, it's not, I'm not sure that um, it, in terms of uh, the movement as a whole, this, um, I think this white, uh, this mainstreaming tendency may actually be gaining some strength right now. Uh, that the terrorist strategy still exists. The people who were the killers and the bank robbers still exist. It's, um, and it's more than just a handful of people. It's, you know, a larger group of folks that are committed to violence. But uh, I think in the last couple of years, in particular since uh, David Duke's success in running for the Louisiana House uh, of Representatives, the State House there, when he won the election in 1989, 
we had uh, a case study, if you will, of the success that could come for somebody that comes straight out of the neo-Nazi movement um, trying to infiltrate the electoral system. And his ideas and his forms of organization have been picked up by others uh, who are trying to uh, do that. Um, they're not winning political office right now, but they, I think they are influencing the way that the political debate happens in the country. So they're having an impact on the other candidates in some ways? I think so, in the same way that if you, say, looked at France, uh, which has a large anti-immigrant racist party called the Front National, uh, other parties, in order to take votes away from the Front National, uh, adopt some of their positions. And what you have now in the electoral arena, and it's not just the electoral arena, but what you have in the electoral arena is people, some uh, politicians adopting parts of the David Duke platform and even some of the David Duke personnel um, and bringing them into their political campaigns. Um, and uh, I think that what that does is it gives those idea currents political legitimacy and changes the way we discuss ideas in the country. And we'll come back to that uh, on some other issues, but may I go to Marlene? And Marlene, another movement we're hearing a lot about uh, around the United States and here in the Northwest is the common law courts movement. For our viewers who would not be familiar with what is happening, is this a more new approach uh, in some of these uh, processes than some of the ones that Lanny was talking about? And also define for the viewers what is the philosophy of that movement? Okay, it's. I think that it's newer in, in the sense of we're seeing it being used again, but it's not a new movement. It's a movement that's been around really for several decades, but it's a strategy that's being reutilized in a more widespread way um, across the country. It's not just something that our region's seeing. Um, and really, I mean, we're, we're seeing a resurgency in this and um, more organization among common law courts across the country. When one of these uh, organizations meets and, and they convene, it's what they call common law court, what are they doing? And what are they saying? They're usually in a hotel room someplace. <laughs> um, what they're doing is putting either individuals on trial or they're putting, um, in, in the case like in Colorado, for instance, the entire government on trial according to um, common law and the Constitution as they define it and the Constitution picking and choosing different areas and then putting either an individual on trial or, in the case, like I said, in Colorado, the entire government. If we can go into this in a little more depth, uh, first of all, they have been self-appointed. <laughs> They've not been appointed by any government entity to right. do this. And then when they meet and they're going to try a person, that person's in absence, they don't have the authority right. to bring them before the court. They don't have any authority at all, Tony. <laughs> um, okay. I think it's one of the things, actually, one of the things I find more humorous, it's sort of like kids playing a game because it's sort of a hollow it's a hollow situation, but they're older, f they're adults who then decide that they think that they have these rights and therefore put someone or something on trial that isn't there, they're self-appointed, and they then, they, they go ahead and proceed along those lines. The unfortunate thing, though, is what we're seeing is judges across the country who are, who are being threatened by these common law courts. Um, one of the their main tactics as far as what the sentencing is, is you'll see a lot of discussion about hanging folks for treason. And whenever you are targeted in that way, I mean, that certainly strikes fear in all of us. Um, and that's something that's going on not only in places like Montana, but even in California um, and really across the country at different levels. Well, now when they meet and they assume they have a prosecutor and then they have a jury, and so once it's over and they, they hand down that verdict, <clears throat> is a lot of times that verdict for that person death? Um, I really couldn't tell you that as far as what the, the most common verdicts are. I've never... But, that, but there are cases where that has been the result? There's certainly... Um, whenever they, they decide that, what, that the infraction is treason, oftentimes they say that the, then the penalty for treason is hanging. And there have been plenty of people across the country who've had... had um, declarations from common law courts calling for their hanging. We'll come back to this. Uh, Lanny, uh, 
when you talked about David Duke a minute ago, and you talked about he had won a seat in the state house of uh, the state legislature in Louisiana, but he also ran for statewide office for the U.S. Senate, and I believe for governor in, in that race for the U.S. Senate, he got a very large vote. In fact, he, he made the runoff. And so my question is that when you have that kind, and, he, and it was known that he had the, the history uh, background as, uh, in the KKK and others, what has that done to the movement around the country to encourage others to run for office that had the same views and same background? Well, uh, his, his campaign was a big plus for all of them. Uh, in 1990, he ran for the U.S. Senate. In 1991, he ran for governor of Louisiana. In both instances, he won over 50 percent of the white vote. And if it hadn't been for the black people in Louisiana, we would have a Nazi as a governor of Louisiana. Um, that's an important point to remember. He also, in the course of it, raised uh, and spent two million dollars on his political campaign, which he couldn't have done if he had been going out in the cow pasture and burning a cross or, you know, organizing swastika daubings on synagogues. Uh, that wouldn't raise, and they couldn't raise and spend that kind of money. So other people. Um, and from organizations as diverse as the American Nazi Party to the Constitutionalists um, have um, taken the same platform uh, and um, tried to run political campaigns and with varying degrees of success. Some of them have done well in primaries and some of them have done poorly in primaries and only pull one or two percent of the vote. Um, I think that uh, there's a connection here in, in with what Marlene is talking about with the common law courts, that's important to point out that um, both the Duke types and the common law court types are drawing from their own version of American history and their own theory of the American government. Um, it's a th notion of the American uh, government as the province of white men and uh, it's a, a racially based theory. And so some of the people would be fooling around with the common law courts now, and might, run, might run for office tomorrow, or vice versa. Um, I think that one of the things that we've seen is an increase in the number of people and the inc increase in the importance um, of the number of people who, uh, for whom biological determinism is a way of viewing the society. Uh, the notion that uh, because of the genes that you inherit, it determines your social standing, your intelligence, your ability to work hard or not work hard. And um, one of the things that's contributed to that is the book, The Bell Curve. Um, for good, um, f as a good interpretation of the bell curve or not, um, I happen to believe that Charles Murray and Richard Ernstein uh, believed, they believed this biological determinism and they're quite willing to let others latch on to it. This is a, a scholarly book. Um, it's a wrong book, but it's a scholarly book that has gained widespread attention for the notion that uh, um, IQ and intelligence is uh, a, the, an inherited characteristic that you receive in the same way that you receive the color of your eyes or the color of your hair from your genetic forebears. Um, when that happens and that becomes part of the mainstream discourse, it's not so far a leap for somebody to take for the David Duke types or for the common law court types. And it's that change, I think, that's been important. If I may jump in, Tony, I think that, to that Lenny hit on an important point as far as the common law courts and the mainstreaming and electing folks to office. When I mentioned the, the Colorado Common Law Court, what's very striking is that a state senator participated in that. And that group was later invited to the Colorado State Legislature to have a hearing in front of a joint, a joint committee where they actually discussed having the, the government on trial. And the next step here is to call the government into accountability. And in, afterwards, I was discussing this with some of the activists from the common law court and asked them, so what do you do now? What happens if the state of Colorado does not secede unless the federal government, you know, reneges on all these other 
these other demands that they had if they didn't, you know, if the federal government didn't change in the ways that the common law court called on them to do it, then what happens? Like, what kind of leverage do they have is what I basically asked him. And his re the response was, well, revolution. And I think that that's an int you know, something that is there is that they are not only thinking about running for office, but they're certainly folks who are in office. And that guy that I talked to <coughs> could have certainly been just a renegade, but they still had that kind of mentality is running at some level through that. And that, that hearing also occurred during the standoff in Montana. What I hear is building evidence here. Uh, when Lanny talks about the, the votes that Duke got and encouraged others to run, so there's a lot of people been running for office with this doctrine, uh, <coughs> although not successful. And then when this publication came out, gave them another uh, tool to use. Uh, and then when you have hearings and, and, and people come in to testify in those situations, it seems to me they're looking for all the kind of credibility for the movement to grow. Lanny, are there other things they're doing that would add to this uh, well, challenge? Well, I think one of the things that it's important to point out is that they have their own racist church. They call it this identity, so-called Christian identity beliefs, which is a, a racially based uh, theology. And uh, it's a way of going to church on Sunday and uh, telling people we're Christians too. We're not uh, swastika bearing, brown shirt, you know, jack booted thugs. You know, we're just regular folks going to church. So part of the mainstreaming. And so that pushes it all into the mainstream. Um, they've they've uh, been doing a, 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 an attempt to get academics involved. They had a conference last year in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, in which about 150 people gathered together, and there were a number of professors and religious leaders, uh, professors from uh, accredited and mainstream universities like Boston University or City University in New York, which are well-regarded universities. But these are people that are, have come together and trying to construct um, an intellectual framework, if you will, for to hang a racial state on. Uh, and um, the trouble for us is that um, most people don't recognize the problem until the racial state gets hung on the framework. I think we're still at the stage where they're building the framework, but we've got to understand you know, what that frame is going to hold. A number of our viewers would not know uh, the doctrine, the Christian identity movement. Can you briefly explain what the, the basic uh, tenets of their doctrine. Well, it's the notion that uh, your uh, relationship to God is determined by your race. And race um, uh, in, a, uh, in a sort of a made-up way. I mean, race is an anthropological category that has a dubious uh, uh, history in, in any case. But um, uh, it's the notion that white people from Northern Europe um, are uh, racially descended from the lost tribes of Israel and therefore um, have uh, a special relationship to God that's different from everybody else, that Jews are satan a satanic force and that people of color are a lower subspecies uh, uh, created before Adam, the first man. And so um, in this cosmology of humankind, really, um, they've created um, a hierarchy in your relationship to God. Uh, the notion that people are, you know, the chosen people or, or whatever has been debated and, and uh, the, the Puritans certainly saw themselves in that light and other religious groups have seen themselves in that light. What we have here, though, is, is really a racial theology. And it goes back to what I was talking about earlier, which is the notion that your genetics um, uh, determine everything you do, this racial de biological determinism. Um, the notion that uh, the chromosomes that you inherited should determine whether or not you're saved uh, or redeemed or whatever and, and determine the relationship to God. 
I think most Americans would find that antithetical. Uh, but when you get into the Bible and you start quoting the Bible to prove your point, then uh, you've got a more powerful mixture. For those who are counting that, and it came out in the other program, one has to be informed and educated to be able to uh, engage in, in, in counter arguments. Would that not be correct? Uh, well, I think Marlene knows uh, better than I, because um, she's dealing with people on, on the front lines of this uh, battle for human rights, I think, yeah, in, a, in a more direct way. I think we need information. Um, but I also think we need an alternative way of looking at the world. And it's not just a battle of facts. Uh, Marlene, um, let's turn to you on that and, and tell us how, how uh, in relation to the concern that you have and that Landy and others, uh, what is the, the counter to uh, any possible growth of the movement? Well, I think what it is is that the white supremacist movement, as Lenny laid out quite well, has a vision for society, and it's a, a vision for one segment of the society to have rights, and by and large what that means is white folks and men. Um, Can I interrupt you there? So when you say white folks, but Lanny was talking about this earlier, but isn't in the structure that it's, it's really in, in positions of power, white, not only white, but men. That, right. That's a gender bias here too. Right, absolutely. I mean, whenever you look at the common law courts um, or most of the white supremacist movement, they talk about a return to the original constitution, which extend rights to white Christian landowning men, or it depends, each one d differs a bit. But I think that as we look at organizing in, in a countervailing way, that what we have to start looking at is what is our vision for society, and that when we talk about issues of equality and freedom and justice, that, off, that what we're talking about is equality and freedom for all people, and they're talking about equality and freedom for some people. And that that's one of the, the biggest issues. It doesn't necessarily matter if you can argue the minutia of the common law court system. I mean, I think it was Bo Greitz who was talking about the mental gymnastics that he went through with the common law court in, in Montana. And we don't need to know that. I mean, that's not necessarily the best way to, to counter this. But instead, whenever you know there's a threat, to speak out. And also, whenever, whenever we're looking at what do we want for our community, I think it's time that we all start taking a step back and saying, what is the community that I want? What is the country that I want? What is the state that I want look like? Much of their doctrine certainly violates major portions of the United States Constitution. On a program a little later, we're going to discuss how this has been a totally misinterpretation of the Constitution. But I'd like to get into another area with you on the common law courts. Uh, am I not correct that from some of the accounts I've heard that when they're not pleased with uh, certain government officials and their decisions, that they take attempt to take an action that personally affects the property of uh, those office right. holders. Would you explain that to us? It's fi filing of liens. So what they do basically is if they were to target somebody, they then file what's called a false lien. It's, it's something that says that that individual owes them money for some reason. And the, the person who's been targeted, let's say it's a judge. So a judge has been targeted. The common law courts file what's called a false lien. It's an official type of document that doesn't have any standing at all. But when the judge goes and tries to sell his home or her home, then they have a, a document on there that says that, that they owe this individual, you know, usually quite large sums of money. These liens are not only being targeted against individuals, but entire states sometimes, or elected officials are being targeted. Um, I'd like to throw in on that for a second. It seems to me that what Marlene is describing is a form of vigilanteism. Absolutely. And um, we've always had vigilanteism in the United States, um, whether it was white vigilanteism to, you know, return slaves to their owners, uh, or uh, the vigilanteism of the Wild West, or the vigilanteism of the lynching movement in the, in the 20s, the teens in the 20s. Um, it seems to me that we've always had that kind of vigilantism. On the other hand, we've also always had a countervailing tendency. And it's really, um, both things reside in the heart of, of both, both good and evil reside in the American heart. And uh, I think it's a, what Marlene is saying is if we're going to um, say no to these white supremacists, we have to say, what is, what is the good that we see? And it's a good that exists in American history. It's a good that's, um, that's uh, brought us uh, as a people 
a long way and that, 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 that if we look for that trend in American history and reach back to that part of our heart um, as a people, then we'll be a better people. Um, and the vigilante types, um, they'll always exist, but they'll be less important to us. So you're describing a struggle between two forces, uh, but does it have a chance to be more successful if there are organizations like what you belong to and others to, to be very active to encourage the choice that you have uh, indicated? Well, I think obviously if uh, the kinds of things that are happening um, with the Northwest Coalition uh, against malicious harassment and uh, the, the Colorado uh, Mountain States group that Marlene is part of, uh, if people get involved in those kinds of organizations, then they're actively participating in their own American life. I, I think a lot of people feel like um, there's nothing they can do personally um, to affect the situation. A lot of people don't vote, for example, because they think that if they vote, it doesn't matter, or if they do, and what you have now is a, a way to participate as a, an American in, in the country's life through organizations, citizens' organizations like this. Marlene, you're, we're about out of time, but would you elaborate upon that and also well, talk about the field of education to help? <laughs> uh, I was just going to actually say that the conference title is facing the threats, and then the subtitle is organizing for justice. And I think that that's what we all have to start doing, is not only face the, the threats, but looking at our organizing as organizing for justice. And, and that that's really what's happening across the region, is that people are really starting to realize that it's, it's on their shoulders. It's on all of our shoulders if we want to see America continue to move forward and include more and more, you know, all of the people who are here that we have to be organizing for and, justice. And that is happening in other parts of the country. I know Atlanta's been very involved with on the East Coast, right. the Center for Democratic right. Renewal, and there's the Southern Poverty Law Center, and there are many, many others. One final question to you, Marlene, and that is, does, is there an important role with young people in education? Absolutely. I mean, young people are the future of this country, and as we're moving, moving forward and, and becoming more involved, the young folks are the ones that we certainly have to be letting them know both sides educating and moving them on in order to have them involved in the process and in civics. On that in note, general. I have to bring our program to a conclusion. Uh, the time has moved very rapidly and we thank both of you for being here and it's been thank very, you. very thank informative you. and thank good you. luck to you in the conference. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you'll be with us again next week when we will continue this series, Facing the Threat. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. The North Idaho College Public Forum was videotaped live from the studios of Telemedia Services on the campus of North Idaho College for viewing at this more appropriate time. We invite you to join us again next week for another all-new edition of the North Idaho College Public Forum on this public television station.